Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 387. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. Today, I'm bringing you something a little different. Our friends at the Wondery Podcast Network are debuting a new show called Safe for Work hosted by Liz Dolan and Matt Ritter. Safe for Work fits right in with what I talk about on Be Wealthy and Smart, setting career goals and maintaining positive business relationships in sometimes challenging workplace situations are crucial to achieving success and financial freedom. Liz and Matt will take calls from listeners, helping them solve problems they are facing, giving advice and sharing their experience and expertise. Here's a clip from the first episode. From Wondery, this is Safe for Work, Job Stress, Life Relief. I'm Liz Dolan. And I'm Matt Ritter. On today's show, we'll be chatting with Rain Wilson about his production company, Soul Pancake. I'm super excited about that. And one of his first days of work. And of course, about playing Dwight on The Office, the world's most dreaded co-worker. Congratulations on the new podcast. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to give you an example of a letter we got. And you tell me what advice you would give this person. Okay, good. I have the world's most annoying co-worker. He is a power-hungry suck-up who inserts himself into everything going on around the office. He is a rule follower to the extreme. Let and me just stop you right there for a second. Did Jim Halpert write this letter? <laughs> <laughs> but first, welcome to our first show. I think it's time for some introductions. Matt, of course, I know who you are. You're sitting right here, but the folks listening might not. Well, if they don't, uh, believe it or not, I'm a recovering corporate lawyer mm-hmm. turned comedian an executive recruiter. And let me tell you something. I've worked in more crazy workplaces than I care to ever think about. I want to hear all about them. And we are going to do that. (laughs) What about you, Liz? Well, I've spent many years running marketing at big global organizations, including Nike, the Oprah Winfrey Network, and National Geographic channels. I've worked in a lot of different company cultures. I've had a lot of bosses, most of them good, some bad. I've been a boss for a long time, Mainly good, I think, but occasionally bad. We're going to have to get you to dish on that. Yes, totally. I would like to confess all of my sins. Plus, I run a media company with my sisters. We produce podcasts and books as the Satellite Sisters. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about our show and what we're going to do here, Matt. And then you guys can decide whether you even pay attention to anything that we say. (laughs) No, you must pay attention to everything that we say. That's right. Yes, Because our goal is to help you find happiness and contentment at work. You know, the culture is so filled with people telling you how to crush it at work, how to get rich and successful. And, you know, that's just not what we're interested in here. We spend more time with our coworkers these days than we do with our family and friends. That's where you get phrases like work wife and work husband. Many of my best friends in the world are actually people that I worked with. It's probably also true that some of my least favorite people in the world came from the office. Oh, really? So who's the worst person you ever worked with? Well, I did have a boss who once fired somebody for taking a nap. That seems harsh. Yeah, well, in fairness, it was during a billion-dollar closing, and that someone was me. (laughs) But he was a jerky boss anyway. Okay. I'm already not surprised, Matt. Already not surprised. So on this show, we're going to listen to your calls and questions. We're going to try to understand what's really important to you and maybe help you articulate what's really important to you. Uh, And then we're going to give you our two cents on how to get the best result for you personally and for your career. Each episode, we'll also be talking to a guest. We'll have all kinds of amazing people, including business experts, people who've gone through fascinating career experiences, and some people who are just fun to talk to. Okay. Well, now that that's all settled, how about we get some listener calls? You ready for your first call, Matt? Let's crush it. No, no crushing. We're not crushing here. Okay, fine. Let's just help people (laughs) and have some fun. Yes. Hello? 
Hey, Kelly, this is Liz and Matt with Safe for Work. How are you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you guys? We are great. So I understand you've been having some issues with feedback in the workplace. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, no problem. So I work in finance um, for a Fortune 50 company, and I got promoted a little less than a year ago, which was awesome. But every few months or so since I got that promotion, I've been hearing and getting feedback, um, mostly in the line of needing to be more professional at work. Um, two recent examples were uh, I commented to another uh, coworker that a teammate of mine who was able to get some flexible scheduling, so maybe working from home four out of five days a week and only coming into the office one day a week was was pretty lucky and that our department really doesn't do flexible working very well. Mm -hmm. And then the second time it happened, a manager um, overheard me on a Friday joking to my teammate um, that it might be a light day um, since our boss was out of the office that day. Uh, mm. And so this feedback kind of just makes its way to me, either through my manager, through my director. And I guess what I'm really wondering is, am, am I wrong in thinking these other managers are overreacting and kind of taking this 360 feedback too far? Well, let me just say, first of all, I can empathize because I was the office jokester. I left my job as a lawyer to do comedy. So if, <laughs> if anyone understands that desire to keep the workplace light, it's me. I was the guy who was joking around all the time. People would hang out. I was the office, the, the break room hero, let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I will say every office has one. Yeah, but I will say the, the, there were a couple of topics that I probably wouldn't have joked about. And from just quickly hearing what you're talking about, you know, the, the topics that you've chosen to kind of joke about are a little bit of danger areas because you're I guess what I would say is you're kind of cutting into the sacred cows of the workplace. Like, you know, when talking about working from home, like that's if somebody had to ask for a work from home situation, like that's a very tough ask for them. And it's probably something that everybody, you know, has to kind of tread lightly on. So I would say like topic wise, if you want to make jokes, that's definitely an area that I would steer clear of because that's more like kind of passive aggressive talking badly about the workplace itself. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not just jokester term. Yeah, I mean, Kelly. Do, I mean, does that does that resonate what I'm saying? I mean, I'm I'm a little. I guess I I need to know more. You know, are are the jokes that you got called out on? Was it just those, or are you getting called out? You know, constantly, anytime you joke around. Yeah, yeah. I'd say those are the examples that stick out. But I'd say I I feel like it's more personality based, almost like. I tend to be a little bit louder in the aisles, I would say, than my coworkers. I, you know, there may be a group of us all around talking and laughing, maybe on a Friday, but then it feels like I'm the one that's getting the feedback that, you know, I need to maybe button it up a little bit more. Um, and so it's starting to feel like my personality is a bit of a liability, um, just in general. You know, Kelly, this is Liz. That's what it sounded like to me, too, when I heard you talking about it and read your original letter. To me, this sounds like coded communication, and they're trying to tell you something important, but not doing it very well. They're picking on a few random things, and that they're trying to manage your not your performance, which you say is good, but your personality and behavior. And that is never a good sign. When people say things to you like, we need you to be more professional, or in your letter, it was be more mature. If, if you've heard that more than once or twice, that is something that you really, really need to pay attention to. Because in my experience, sometimes you can, you can manage people through their performance. You sit down and you say you need to do this better or you need to do that better. But when you get to the point where you're saying you just need to be a different person, that's that's really bad, and you really need to think about whether this is the natural home for you. Because I would never say nobody should ever go into work and have to be a different person than they really are, right? So if you're yeah. out, if you're outgoing and energetic in a department where they really frown upon that, then you just need to think about whether you're going to be satisfied having to edit yourself all the time. I would suggest that you won't be satisfied doing that. Yeah, there's a lot of workplaces that I'm too loud for, yeah. for sure. You really? Know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I think I hear what you're saying. Like what Matt's saying is like, I can choose the things that I talk about, right? Sure. The things mm -hmm. that I, the things that I choose to engage in conversation about with my coworkers. And maybe what I can't choose is, you know, the, 
attitude with with which I with which I bring or or yeah. kind of my vibe, right? So Your vi- right. I, you can't. I, I need to play with that a little <laughs> bit, but I totally hear what you're saying, Matt, about the the certain topics that are, you know, hey, if you're going to talk about them, maybe take it take it down to the to the coffee shop, right? Like out of earsight of managers and directors, if you really need to vent, um, and then balancing that with still wanting to be who I am at work. Yeah, totally. And I like your vibe. I feel like we would get along. <laughs> but at the same time, I, I'm glad you're hearing what I'm saying because, you know, maybe this workplace isn't for you, but even another workplace, those two examples probably wouldn't be okay, even in a cooler, more laid back vibe. That's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate the advice. I think I knew it in my heart and in my head, but it's all, it's just good to hear it from someone else that I'm not crazy for wanting to be myself, um, but also keeping in mind if I want to move up in any organization that, you know, there's that level of professionalism um, yeah. that can, that can, it can vibe with my personality if I, if I find the right place. You can do it. Okay. I good luck. You. All right. Thank you guys. And now for our interview with Rain Wilson. Rain Wilson, welcome to Safe for Work. Nice to be here. Okay, so it is our first episode. So we're talking a lot about like our worst or best first days of work. Do you have like a worst day of work story you want to share or best day, best first day? I have a lot of really bad work stories. That was just a preview. To hear Rain's terrible work stories and the rest of the episode, find a link in the episode notes or subscribe to Safe for Work on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this. And now back to Be Wealthy and Smart. This show is about eight money tips for beginners. And you're going to learn what advice I gave to a college student slash driver who is eager to be smart with his money. Well, recently I had to fly into LAX returning from Tahiti and that meant I had a two and a half hour drive back to Palm Springs. So I hired a driver and I was lucky enough to get a delightful young man who I just really adored. He was so fun and so eager to learn more about finances and wanted to pick my brain while he had me in the car. So we had a good time back and forth talking about finances and money and what he could do to be smart with getting off the ground and just being sort of a student, but also being in between jobs right now because he had been in human resources for a major corporation and then got laid off. So in order to generate some income, he was working as a driver, but he also was going to be going back to law school. So he had a lot of things going on and a lot of different decisions to make with what he wanted to do with his life. And it was one of those places I think we all can relate to and when we were young and just starting out that you're so hopeful, you want to have success and you want to be able to build wealth and you want to be able to enjoy things in life, but you also are picking a career path and wondering, you know, do I have to do something I really don't enjoy doing in order to do that? Is that how I'm going to make a good living is by being miserable or is there a way I can really enjoy what I do and make a good living? So we had a little bit of that conversation too. But I gave him eight specific things that I thought he could do right now, being on a limited income, not really being familiar with anything to do with money or finance or investing, and wanting to have a good outcome in his life. So you can kind of play along vicariously in the car with the conversation and imagine the conversation that we had. But here are the things I told him to do. We first talked about his 401k, and I asked if he had participated in the 401k where he had worked at the major corporation. And although he was in charge of human resources and therefore very familiar and even having to sell the concept of why it was important to invest in a 401k to his coworkers, he in fact admitted he had not invested in his 401k, had not contributed any money, and therefore unfortunately missed out on the free money match of 6% that his employer was giving. So he did say that he just couldn't see that it would make sense for him. And I said, well, it does make sense in a few ways. First of all, you're able to contribute money without paying tax on that. So there is a tax advantage right up front. Two, you do get the free match. So the 6% match that the employer gives, that is free money that's put into your account. And then it will grow without tax within the account until you take it out at retirement. 
And he said, well, is it all about retirement? Because that seems like a very far way away. And I think really he was a little concerned about locking the money up for so many years. And I said, no, it's not always about retirement, but here's the thing. Since you're so young, when you start early, you don't have to put much into your retirement account in order for it to grow into a much larger amount by the time you retire. And the reason is you have time on your side for compounding. So you can put in much less money, but if you start when you're young enough, it's going to grow much bigger than if you wait 10 years to start. Then you're gonna have to put in more money to get to the same amount at retirement age. So you may as well just put a little bit in when you're young and that money will grow and accumulate and compound and make that big difference at retirement. So you can have a big impact at retirement. It can be about retirement, but it's not all about retirement because you're putting in really a lot less money when you're younger because you can, because the compounding will take care of a lot of the growth of the money for you. So he really got that concept and said, when he gets another job full time, he will contribute to his 401k. Next, I said, since you're not working for a big corporation right now and you're in between going back to school and maybe looking for another job, you can contribute to an IRA. And again, you're going to get some tax advantages and depending on whether you wanna do a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA, I explained to him in the Roth IRA how his money would be taxed, but when he took money out when he retired, he wouldn't have to take it out at 70 and a half and he wouldn't have any tax on it when it came out at retirement. On the other hand, if you wanted to do a traditional IRA, he wouldn't pay tax on it today and it would grow without tax, but when he took it out, he would be forced to take it out by age 70 and a half and penalized if he took it out before age 59 and a half with a 10% penalty and tax on money that he hadn't paid tax on yet. And I explained how you either pay tax up front and then don't have to pay tax later or you don't pay tax up front and do have to pay tax later. So I explained those two different benefits. Then I thought, well, there's some practical things that I could tell him to do that he may or may not be already doing. They're pretty obvious things, but sometimes, since I don't know this person, and sometimes since younger people, you're not quite sure what they've been told, what habits their parents had, what they know, what they don't know, I thought, well, I'll just put the obvious out there too. So I said a few obvious things that you might already be doing is you might already be paying your bills on time. But make sure whatever bills you have, that you do pay them on time. And that way you'll establish great credit. Great credit is always a good thing to have and it comes in handy when you're looking to buy a house or a condo and finance a car and other things. So it's important to start having great credit. So I encouraged him to make sure he paid his bills a few days before they were due and always pay his bills on time. I also said, pay off your credit cards each month and don't carry balances. I didn't wanna ask if that was the situation he was in or not because it's really none of my business and I didn't want to pry. So I just said, if you have balances on your cards, pay off those balances as soon as you can. If you don't have balances on your cards, that's great. Don't get any balances on your cards and be really responsible with your cards. The basic cards to have would be like a card for gasoline, a card for a store, maybe a major department store. And then also you could consider about getting cards for things like air travel and maybe one for a hotel that you could accumulate points on because he said he wanted to travel. That was one of his major goals. And that way he can start saving up miles and points to get free hotel rooms and free airfare. And that that would be a good way to help him pay for his travel and make it less expensive. I also encouraged him to set spending priorities. In addition to travel, he did say he was looking to buy a car, wanted to buy a house, but it was very expensive in Southern California. And so he was looking at some other options, condos and some other things. And so he did have some spending priorities that were important to him. And I just encouraged him to be really mindful of his money to not just go out, blow it at restaurants or bars or on things that he didn't really value, but to really think about and write down maybe five things that he really wanted to spend his money on, such as what he had said, travel, car, a home, etc., and really start to save money, and that was point seven, save money as much as he could 
and start accumulating capital because that was going to give him options. It's going to give him options to become an investor. It's going to give him options to maybe purchase his car and get a better deal, purchase a condo, etc. So you need to be serious about saving and there's not great rates out there right now. So saving in a bank account was just fine. He was very, very appreciative of that. The final tip I gave him was to listen to podcasts because podcasts give you free advice. He's in the car a lot driving. He can listen to that instead of the car radio. Really use his time to learn about investing, about finances, about money, about everything he needs to know and get really savvy. And it's all free information. So I encouraged him to listen to podcasts, of course, this one especially, and really get to know more about what he was wanting to know about. So in summary, what I told this nice young man was to pay his bills on time, contribute to a 401k and get free money. Number three, in between corporate gigs, contribute to an IRA. Number four, pay off your credit cards. And if you have a credit card balance, consider going on a cash basis until you can pay off those credit cards. But hopefully he could be responsible and not get credit card debt to begin with. Number five, if he is handling credit responsibly, then he could sign up for some credit cards with airline miles and for hotel points. And that way, even though he's paying a fee for those cards, perhaps you buy one ticket, you get to bring a guest free. And also he is racking up hotel points so he can get some free hotel stays, which would be great. Number six, set spending priorities like travel, buying a car, buying a condo or home, etc., and really know where you are with wanting to spend your money, being really mindful about how you want to use money and using it as a tool instead of just wasting money and not being mindful, just wasting it on eating out or bar bills or other things that aren't even important to you. So make sure you're spending your money where you really want it to go. Number seven, save as much money as you can. Put aside money, save it up. It's always important to be a good saver because it gives you options of things to do. And you all know it's the second step to wealth is saving a nest egg. So it's very, very important in the wealth building process. And number eight, of course, listen to podcasts and especially be wealthy and smart. I encouraged him to go back to the very first podcast and start listening from the beginning and learning all of the different ins and outs of financial maneuvers and tactics and practices and mindset and investing and all the different topics that we talked about. So he was really grateful. He was so very nice and felt like it really made a difference for him to know these things. And once again, I reiterated my belief to him that if you make the right decisions, you can become wealthy. But if you make the wrong decisions, you won't become wealthy. And I stressed how contributing to a 401k early is one of those very, very important right decisions that need to be made that will make a very big difference in your future. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.